Welcome to Second Take, the show that takes a look at the issues behind the news. Government and business launched the second phase of a partnership that has been key to tackling load shedding and other crises. Terence Screamer joins me to discuss the aims of this new phase. Hi Terence. Hi Chanel. What is the background to this partnership? Well really it goes back to COVID and uh, business came to the party in a big way during that period. It was a catastrophe for the economy. Business uh, was in a very bad state as well, you know. Uh, so the, the, we got together as well, government and organized business got together in a very constructive way and did a lot of good initiatives during that. I think the, you know, the way we managed the TERS, the UIF payments, uh, the way South Africa eventually got, started to get vaccines into the country was a lot about this working together. And in parallel, there was a lot of things happening in the country. You know, we had come out of a long period of state capture. We were just about to get our back onto our feet, and then we went into this deep COVID hole. And uh, part of the, 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 the hole that we were in was the load shedding crisis was really intensifying during that period. And, uh, you know, business sort of said, could we use this as a template uh, for other to attack other crises? in the economy. Uh, obviously the, the, the relationship with government and business was tense. The relationship with society and government was very tense at the time. So was this just business coming in to bail out government? Uh, there, were, there were a number of concerns about the partnership but they, they got together and looked at other areas to, to cooperate and, uh, and uh, I think that it's been, uh, it's been a constructive sort of uh, relationship that has developed following a very uh, long period of a trust deficit really related to the corruption that emerged during the state capture years. Would the partnership be seen as successful? Yes, I think the COVID phase was definitely seen as a successful phase. Then it, the, there was this pledge that CEOs made uh, looking to say that they're going to support government even though there was this, this worry about um, the way government was behaving in society and its drag on the economy, the corruption that was sort of prevalent still, um, and a lot of political opposition to government. So they went in and they made this pledge and they said, we're gonna help out uh, uh, in a few areas. And I think it's been successful. The, the big ticket one has definitely been load shedding. So load shedding, as we know, was became the biggest crisis in South Africa. It was really weighing down the South African economy the amount of percentage points it lopped off our GDP, not only during the intense phase, but in the, the, the decade that preceded that intense phase from about 2019, 2020, 20, you know, from 2020 onwards, it was really intense and it was really a weight on confidence. And we've seen the collaboration there be very effective. Lots of uh, private skills were injected to help Eskom fix Eskom. Uh, a, a lot of effort around also thinking about the new architecture for the electricity supply industry and uh, the, the president set up the, the, the uh, energy action plan and the national energy crisis committee and through that collaboration we've seen that they've, it's a major success so the number of elements you know why we've got no load shedding but and there are a number of elements to it and uh, but all these different uh, components have come together to come to a point where we now had six months without any load shedding. And uh, there's definitely a, a part of that was this collaboration with business. Obviously, the big ticket item from my perspective was when Treasury gave the, the debt relief of 254 billion, which helped Eskom to be in a position to plan maintenance and actually implement the maintenance. So they did plan it in the past, but they didn't have the financial wherewithal to do it. And I think then the injection of skills from the private sector meant that that maintenance was done better and uh, in a, a more clinical way. And also the relationship that merged the, around the, the PFMA, where Eskom didn't have to, uh, you know, they got exemptions from the way they had to approach the private sector. I think to have a partnership approach in attacking the coal fleet was also important. And then obviously many other things also took place. The demand has come down quite uh, a lot and that's related to the weak economy but also to the, the amount of solar that were, and battery 
that got injected into the system from the private sector, from uh, uh, residences and businesses. And that has helped create the space as well. So the money and uh, planning was there for maintenance, the skills injection from the private sector, but the space was also created by that lower demand to, to allow Eskom to do uh, the, um, the maintenance. And that's really about that solar injection that came in and battery injection. So I think, yes, so that's the big ticket success on top of the COVID success. What are the current areas of focus and how does it fit in under the new GNU? Yeah, I think the current areas remain. Um, it's, it's still going to be the electricity crisis is not over. Uh, it's the logistics crisis and it's the crime and corruption crisis. So those are still the three areas that the partnership is really uh, focused on. And there's been pressure because uh, this is very much linked to the reform agenda out of National Treasury and the, and the presidency to maybe add a few additional um, focus areas. But both, I think, government and business feel quite stretched at the moment. Uh, and so I think there, there might, there'll be an evolution under electricity, for instance, um, and maybe adding a municipal component to that, for instance. But there's a lot of focus on the crisis at municipalities and government and whether business, this partnership can't help there. And I think that might evolve, um, uh, you know, in future into the, especially that, that focus area of electricity where there's a proper crisis at the municipal level and water. And uh, those, uh, so that, that I think we could see that evolving, but at the moment they're sticking to their knitting of electricity, the logist freight logistics crisis and crime and corruption. So, and I think the, we, we're gonna start seeing some important developments, particularly in the freight logistics area a lot of the thought leadership has happened behind the scenes. Uh, the uh, Putting in the frameworks for private sector participation. So where electricity was maybe three years ago, freight logistics is at that point where we can start implementing. Um, and I think we're going to see some action there. It needs to happen. It's a big weight on the economy. Our ports are remain inefficient and undercapitalized from an equipment perspective injection of private ingenuity, skill, leadership into certain of the terminals will definitely help. We know that's being held up by some uh, legal uh, action, but I think that will eventually start happening. And then the big one is going to be in, the, in rail. You know, what are we going to do beyond, you know, just the private sector helping out, getting in a step in OEM to try to get the Chinese locomotives back onto the rail, which will help. <laughs> will definitely help. Something like 90 locomotives are sitting idle because they don't have spare parts. So that's, that step in partnership is going to be very important. And already uh, there's been some workarounds there, and that's very much through the National Logistics Crisis Committee, but really to bring in proper private sector participation into the rail sector. I think that's going to be the, the next big uptick that we're going to see. And uh, we can see with the new second phase, they've set this target of 3% uh, growth for, from 2025. That's quite a big, hairy, audacious goal, as they would call it. Because, you know, we've been tracking at uh, around the 1.2% for over a decade now. So to the step up to 3%, which we have to do if we're going to start dealing with our socio-economic crises, um, we, is going to be a big step up. But they put together a sort of a model as government and business and saying if we do this in energy, if we do this in freight logistics, and the big thing is to get to sort of close to this 200 million tons of rail volumes moved. We know we're near that at the moment, but if we can start doing that sort of thing, we can do, and also sort out water <laughs> in the background, you know, that's, that's a big thing. Um, and also bring confidence around that we're actually dealing with crime because that's what weighs on all businesses across all sectors and visible progress on prosecutions around corruption. I think there's that confidence plus those actions in those specific areas. The actual investment, say 23 billion more into renewable energy, another four gigawatts of renewable energy next year. If we do that, we can get onto the sort of three, three and a half percent trajectory. It's, it's going to be very hard to achieve, no doubt, in that year period. But that's the sort of, uh, sort of ambition that's being sent, uh, set there. 
So I think those, still sticking to the knitting of those three focal areas, but maybe adding in around those focal areas or even introducing new areas, particularly around water and municipalities, we could start seeing that in future. What are some of the potential risks? Oh, well, what the first risk is you've set out this target, <laughs> 3%. It's going to be very hard to achieve, and then people will look back and say, well, why do you set such, um, such targets that you're not going to set yourself up for failure? But you never know, because as we've seen with the load shedding crisis, uh, you know, the fact that we've had six months of no load shedding, this early uh, in the recovery of ESKIM and the other reforms that are coming is a big win. And so to set some ambition, I think it's good to have this ambitious target, even though it's going to be a very a difficult one to achieve. The other risk is obviously the GNU. Will that hold together? Because at the moment, this is the glue in the GNU. The growth agenda is the glue. These reforms are the, the glue, but there's a lot of, of things peeling away from that glue. You know, we've seen what's happened in Shwane recently. That, is, that was a negative. We can see the opposition around NHI and the Bella Bill. But then we also see the positives you know, around home affairs, which is very much an Operation Vulundlela thing to try and get um, the, the uh, home affairs really working and digitized. Mm -hmm. So we're seeing those elements. So there's successes, there's things that are gluing them together as a GNU, and there's things that are pulling the GNU apart. So if the GNU comes apart early, I think that's a risk to this partnership. Although business has been able to navigate that in the past. I mean, there was a lot of opposition to business coming into partnership uh, in the latter years of the, the sixth administration. They're saying, why are you bailing out government when let them just fail? But so they've stuck to, stuck to the government in the past, so they may stick to a post-GNU regime, but I think that's a, a, that's a big risk. And the other big risk is the, the sort of governance around private sector participation, you know. Could there be hollowing out? Could there be price gouging? Could there be unintended consequences of sort of private interests, you know, um, taking up aspects that really are about national purpose and making profits out of that? That is a big risk. Um, and we, uh, need, there needs to be continual focus on the frameworks, on the policy. I think it is possible to definitely do it in a way where the public good is the most important comes to the fore rather than the profitability for the shareholders of the private enterprise. But there's a tension there, and that tension is not going to go away because that's the way business operates. They're always looking to maximize profits, and we, but we can't afford them to come in and ma with a profit maximization mindset around public infrastructure, around electricity, around water, um, you know, and all these other things that we need to do and freight logistics. We need the costs to come down or at least stabilize, not go up. So that whole profit motive versus public good needs to be managed. And then ultimately, we need the departments to start being doing their jobs. You know, can't all come and coordinate through crisis committees and through the presidency. Actually, these, these departments need to start punching their weight. They're not. We're seeing signs, as I said, green shoots at home affairs, etc. but really, and electricity and energy, I mean, really uh, good progress there. So we, we are seeing some green shoots, but we need these departments to really start punching out. We need the Department of Mineral Resources and Energy to get this cadastre thing sorted out for mining exploration. You know, there's a whole lot of these things that they just need to start punching their weight, and they're not. And if we can start, so use these crises constructively, but not to just keep consolidating around the presidency Getting the department to start working can be very positive, but there are risks. And the big one, I think, is that tension between the profit-seeking motivation and the public good motivation. And managing that, I think we've done quite well up to now, but we have to keep our eyes wide open and stay alert to make sure that there isn't this, um, this profit motive starting to creep in and take over that public good, you know, what is the public in the public interest. Thank you. That's the second tech show for this week. Thank you for watching and join us again next time for more news analysis. Also, don't forget to listen to the audio version of our Engineering News Daily email newsletter.